I want to welcome you to our online worship as the Hope Valley Family of Faith on this 20th Sunday after Pentecost, October the 18th. This morning, in the safety of our own homes, we join our hearts in the worship of Almighty God, and we give thanks for God's calling on our lives. In the midst of this anxious world, we will calm our hearts and our minds as we read and proclaim sacred scripture, and as we offer our prayers to God. We will contemplate and think about our spiritual gifts and the ways that we can continue to invest our lives in our families, our community, and in God's kingdom. And as always, I want to thank you for your generosity as you regularly support our church through your, church, through your tithes and your offerings. Now let's prepare our hearts and our minds to experience God's presence with us this morning. Our unison call to worship comes from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Now, would you join with me for a moment of silence and our invocation? Holy God, you have made us in your image, and we belong to you alone. Therefore, we offer ourselves to you in service, in love, and in praise. Use us for the glory of your kingdom and for the good of your people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The gospel reading this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. 
You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hello, I'm glad to be with you today. I have some questions I want to ask. Listen carefully. Here's the first one. If it takes 12 minutes to hard boil one egg, how many minutes does it take to hard boil two eggs? 12 minutes. You just put them in the water together. Okay, how about a Bible question? How many of each kind of animal did Moses take with him on the ark? The answer, none. It was Noah that took the animals on the ark. You had trouble with either of those two questions. It's okay, because I was trying to trick you. Though I ask these tricky questions just for fun, sometimes trick questions can be mean. They're asked to get someone in trouble. Did you know that people tried to trick Jesus? That's what happened in our Bible story. Jesus was asked a trick question by a group of Pharisees, Jewish religious leaders, who were trying to get Jesus in trouble. They asked, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? This was a trick question because if Jesus had said yes, that you should pay taxes to Caesar, some of the Jewish people would have been very upset with him because they didn't like Caesar. But if he had said no, that you shouldn't pay taxes to Caesar, he would have gotten in trouble with the Roman government. Jesus saw through their plan and he did a very wise thing. He asked them to show him a coin. And he said, whose picture is on the coin? And they answered, it is Caesar. Caesar was the Roman ruler whom all the taxes were paid to. Jesus then said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what belongs to God. Today I brought a brand new 2020 quarter, or quarter dollar as it's officially called. You can pause this message right now if you'd like to go and get a newer quarter so you can look at one too. On this quarter, there's an image of George Washington, our first president. Well, we can't give this coin to him because he died a very long time ago. But right above his image are the words, United States of America. That's what it says on the top of newer quarters, which means that we can use this coin to help pay our government taxes. Taxes are used to help build our roads and provide parks and police officers and many other things. But what about God? Jesus said, give to God what belongs to God. Well, what does that mean? What things are God's? Well, everything. God made sunshine and rain and flowers and trees and fields, mountains, eagles, bananas, friends, tomatoes, everything. And one way we can give back to God is to praise God and to thank God for all the things we have been given. 
But do you know what else God made? You and me. And according to the Bible, not only were people created by God, but also they were created in the image of God. We bear God's image, which means we belong to God. And so as much as God wants us to praise and be thankful for the things we are given for creation, what God wants even more is us, for us to give ourselves to Him by living the way God wants us to, following Jesus, loving others. We belong to God. We are made in God's image. May our lives prove it as we seek to live for Him always. Amen. Join with me for prayer. Almighty God, creator and sustainer of life, we gather to worship to offer our praise and adoration. We are mindful this morning of the salvation that comes through the atoning death of your Son, Jesus Christ. We are grateful for the love and mercy you extend to each of us, we are often so aware of our failures and sins. We know that we have no righteousness of our own. And while we are aware of our weaknesses, we also acknowledge and treasure your great love for us. We gather as people called by your name and as people committed to the advancement of your kingdom here on this earth. You are our God and we want to serve you in this community. Continue to open doors of service so that we can make a difference in this community. Open our eyes so that we can see the opportunities for ministry that are around us. Give us a spirit of compassion and a willingness to serve. Bless the ongoing ministries of this church and broaden our horizons as we serve you and the members of this community. We ask these blessings in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I don't like yes or no questions. I liked them as a child because I needed absolute answers. I wanted the world to be a safe, secure place where the answers were yes or no, absolutely right or absolutely wrong. No middle ground, just right or wrong. But through the years, I've come to realize that yes or no questions often simplify the issues for the sake of having an answer. I've also discovered that there are plenty of issues that are much too complicated for a simple yes or no answer. As a minister, there are plenty of times when people want simple answers to complex questions. And I've discovered that one of the pitfalls of education is that the more information you have, the more difficult it becomes to package all the information into a single simple answer. I know that some of you through the years have kept up with the financial markets. You may remember the former chairman of the Federal Reserve Board from 1987 to 2006, Alan Greenspan. He was recognized 
as one of the most knowledgeable people alive on economic policy. But of the times that I listened to him, I never heard him give a simple yes or no answer. In fact, I don't think I ever understood one of his answers. Because the longer he talked, the more convoluted the answer became. His vast knowledge didn't serve him well in giving clear answers. But the world still wants simple answers to complex questions. I've given up the illusion that if I can just learn enough, I can have the answers. I know that sometimes I just need to listen to the question. When you ask me about why you, discuss, why you developed cancer, I need to just listen to your question. When a parent loses a son or a daughter, I just need to listen to the questions. I'll admit I used to have more answers than I have now, but the pat answers that I learned years ago, I've quit giving. I've come to realize that listening and being present may be what I need to do. I don't have all of the answers, and it's not necessary for me to have them. It's been a slow and gradual process for me to come to this realization. Some questions are just simply unanswerable. Other questions have no clear answers. And some questions are just setups. Regardless how you answer the question, there is a downside. Those kinds of questions remind me of the have you stopped beating your wife yet question. And that was the kind of question that Jesus was asked in our text today. This section of Matthew's Gospel records Jesus' last trip to Jerusalem. The events occurred during Passover week. The Jewish leaders had determined that Jesus must be eliminated, and so they began looking for a reason Chapters 22 and 23 of Matthew contain several tough questions intended to trap Jesus with his own words. They had two real purposes, discredit Jesus with the crowd and find a legal charge that would stick when they put him on trial. Well, the crowds were all struck by his teachings. The Pharisees assumed that this country bumpkin from Nazareth could be put in his place if they would just ask him some tough questions. They thought that the crowds would quickly fade into the background if they could demonstrate that Jesus was out of his league when viewed alongside the learned teachers of the law. I find it interesting that the Herodians and the Pharisees teamed up to question Jesus. These two groups were diametrically opposed. They represented the two extremes of how to deal with Rome. The Herodians represented the interest of Herod, who ruled Palestine under the auspices of the Roman Empire. They were secular Jewish power brokers who favored working with the occupying Roman forces. Conversely, the Pharisees were religious purists who couldn't stand the idea of a foreign power controlling their sacred land. These were two opposite viewpoints collaborating together to silence a common enemy. The plot was to ask Jesus about the census tax. It seems that every adult male was required to pay Rome an annual tax of one denarius, the normal daily wage. Paying taxes has never been popular, but it, is, it was even more unpopular when the money went to a foreign power. And so they came to Jesus with a lose-lose proposition. 
a no-win situation. Is it right to pay the tax to Rome? If he advocated paying the tax, he would alienate the multitudes who hated the occupying Roman forces. But if he answered no, Jesus could be charged with leading a rebellion against the Romans. Flip a coin, heads you lose, tails I win. Jesus is set up for a fall, and he recognized it for what it was. Jesus knew that every question is not worth answering. So instead, he just asked them a question. Do you have a coin? Jesus didn't have one, but they did. And so they produced a denarius, and Jesus asked, whose image is on the coin? Well, that was obvious. Why, Caesar, of course. Then give to Caesar the things that are his. But to God, give him the things that are his. The beauty of this answer is that he both concedes the payment of the census tax while subverting the reach of Caesar's power. Rather than straddling the fence, his answer proclaims God's ultimate claim on our lives. His answer illustrates his understanding of the Hebrew scriptures and the theology including in it. He remembered the 24th Psalm that we read this morning as our call to worship, where the psalmist affirms that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. Give Caesar his coin, but recognize that God owns it all. That coin may carry the portrait of the Caesar, but every single person, to use the language of Genesis, is created in the image of God. Give your coin to Caesar. God's claim is on you. This passage demonstrates Jesus' ability to read people and their motives, as well as his ability to read, interpret, and teach the essence of the Hebrew Scriptures. When I started reading and studying this text this week, I thought it was about the separation of church and state, the idea that Jesus conveniently divided life into two separate spheres, one secular and one sacred. But after reading and thinking about this text, I think that Jesus was emphasizing our ultimate allegiance to God. While the Jews were arguing about paying the census tax, Jesus turned the focus toward God's right to our lives. They were talking about Caesar's face on the coin. Jesus was talking about God's reflection on each of our faces. Their side of the equation might be the easier of the two. Responsible citizenship is not necessarily a matter of faith. It is about our responsibility as citizens and participants in a democracy. It's not dependent on a particular faith position. The social contract that is woven into the fabric of our society applies to all of us, regardless of our faith position or whether we claim a faith position. We pay taxes, we respect our elected officials, and we participate in the choosing of our leaders. We do that because that is what we owe as participants in this country and this society. This is rendering to Caesar what is Caesar's, or as we might say in this country, give to Washington what is Washington's. There is nothing faith-based about patriotism or nationalism. Those are values that are a part of our society. Jesus acknowledges that citizenship brought responsibility. His real challenge, though, was on the second part. How do we give to God what is rightfully God's? I think that Jesus is talking about who or what we worship. Now, I hesitate to say that because most people associate worship 
with Sunday morning. But I think that Jesus was talking about something broader. Like when Jesus said, you can't serve both God and mammon, God and money, God and things. And I think that Jesus was talking about worship there as well. Worship has to do with what we place at the top of our pyramid of values. What we value the most. Now most people use the word God as a personal name. But the word God refers to whatever we place as the highest value in our lives. It may be that you've placed our creator as your highest value, or it could be something else. We live in a culture where there are numerous voices competing for our allegiance. There is a chorus of voices trying to gain our allegiance. And they're not all bad. We have responsibilities to our families, our jobs, our community, our nation. And in the midst of all of these, Jesus keeps pointing us toward the one who has stamped his image on each of us. As sure as the dollar bill has George Washington's face on it, your face reflects the image of the Creator. You may remember from our recent Sunday school lesson that the second of the Ten Commandments related to images or idols. The Hebrews were prohibited from making any image of God. They were not to make any wooden or engraven sculptures of God. That was prohibited. Nothing created was to take the place of God as a representation of God. Of course, the number of possessions that people own has exploded since then. And it may be that the challenge we face is to not let our possessions, our things, to take the place of God in our lives. The only images of God that were allowed were human beings. We alone of the creation was made in God's image. There is something about us that we share with God that the rest of the creation does not have. This distinctiveness, this different, reflects something about God. You and I have the ability to reason that the rest of the created world does not have. You and I have the capacity to make moral choices Most of the animal kingdom acts on reflex or instinct. But we can think about and we can choose how we will act. Perhaps we would not be held responsible for our actions if we didn't have this higher ability to reason. That ability to reason may be a part of what it means to be made in the spitting image of our creator God. While most of us claim to love God, the challenging issue for me is how I treat those who bear God's image, those created to look like God. It's so much easier for me to say, I love God who I have not seen, than it is to treat with respect those who have been created in God's image. When Jesus commanded us to give to God the things that are God, he was expanding our awareness of God's claim on our, on our lives. While property, family, political parties, and national allegiances want to claim top spot in our lives, Jesus keeps pointing us towards something more. The one we worship, the one we call God, the one who has left his mark on each one of us, this one calls us to follow him. And each generation of Christians face the same challenge that we do. How can we make God our priority when there are so many other claims on our time and our energy? But God keeps calling us to follow him. We often think of that as a one-time commitment 
that moment when we initially decided to follow Christ. But it is also a daily choice we make as we choose to continue listening and following God's leading. This morning, we worship God. We read and meditate on sacred scripture. We offer our heartfelt prayers. We consider how we are investing our lives. And we seek God's guidance as we think and pray about the future of this church. And all of this is a part of our worship. All of this is acknowledging our primary allegiance to God, our Creator, and our allegiance to Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so we praise God and we follow Christ as we worship today. Amen. I invite you to receive this benediction. Now may the God who calls us to follow him provide the courage, the strength, and the determination that each of us need. And may the Son accompany us each step of the way. Amen.